Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody, and uh, you're all very welcome to the uh, Institute's afternoon. My name is Alex White, Director General here at the IIEA, um, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the third event of the 2024 uh, Development Matters Lecture Series, which is kindly sponsored uh, by Irish Aid. And it's also worth noting um, that, again, that 2024 marks Irish Aid's 50th anniversary. And that, of course, that whole initiative um, it was a prerequisite of our joining the uh, EEC uh, um, back in the 1970s. Um, it's just, you know, uh, worthwhile just remembering that and noting it. But we're delighted to be uh, joined this afternoon by Minister Sean Fleming. Um, and Minister Fleming, in a few minutes, will uh, address you for um, perhaps 20, 25 minutes or so. I'll leave that up to him. And then we'll have a QA and a uh, with the whole event um, finishing within, within the hour. Uh, so um, just to, to mention that to you. For those of you in the room, um, please raise your hand. If you have a question, when we do get to the Q&A, we'll come to you. We'll have a roving mic. If you're online, watching us online, as many people are, uh, you'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function uh, on Zoom. Uh, the presentation and the Q&A um, this afternoon are both on the record. Um, and you can, if you're that way minded, you can join the discussion on social media using the handle at IIEA and hashtag development matters. And we're also streaming, live streaming <clears throat> this afternoon's discussion. So a very warm welcome to you if you're uh, viewing uh, viewing us and listening um, on YouTube. So before um, we go to our uh, distinguished guest speaker, I'm delighted to invite in the first instance, Kyle O'Sullivan, who is director um, of Afri the Africa Division in Irish Aid. And um, I think, yeah, it was right here to uh, come forward um, and perhaps just to do some introductory remarks. And we're delighted to have you here, Ky um, Kyle. I'll give you the floor. Um, so I'll just add my welcome um, to the welcome to Red Express to everyone who's joined us here today to hear from Minister of State Fleming on Irish Aid 50 and on the priorities for Ireland's development policy. Um, obviously, I want to thank Alex and, and Jill uh, at the IAA for all of their work on the Development Matters series. For us in DFA, this is a really important and a really valuable forum. Um, brings together opinion formers from around the world to contribute to debates on development, human, humanitarian crises, climate change, and governance, to list just a few of the topics. The way we see it, the series has two particularly important functions. It's an opportunity to engage in important discussions on the international development agenda. And secondly, it helps to communicate priorities and development practice to the public. So those are the two particular advantages we see. Um, Today, the Minister reflects on how much work he has done with our partners and friends in Africa, uh, including several trips there since his address here last time at the IAEA. The 50th anniversary of Irish Aid is also a central theme. So 50 years, Irish Aid has brought hope, help and friendship to people in extreme poverty around the world. So timely opportunity to reflect on the impact Irish Aid has had, but more importantly, to look a little bit towards the future uh, and the priorities uh, and the challenges that are up ahead. So that's why we see events like today is extremely important and our partnership with the IAA is extremely important and valuable. Um, thanks again for joining us here today, virtually in person. Hand you back to Alex and we'll get started. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Kyle. Uh, Sean Fleming, TD, is Minister of State at the Department of Foreign Affairs with responsibility for international development and diaspora. He was appointed to that role in December 2022, having previously served as Minister of State at the Department of Finance. Um, Minister Fleming was elected to represent the Leash Offaly constituency most recently at the 2020 general election. Um, we won't talk about the next general election, when that might be, um, but uh, Sean is a, a veteran uh, TD, member of the Oil Aaron, first elected there in 1997. And you can imagine we've been having some uh, interesting chats in the last few minutes before we got going on events at the weekend. So but it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce to you Minister Sean Fleming. Thank you very much, Alex, for that kind introduction. And it's a, a pleasure for me to address this group, the Institute of International and Economic Affairs, for the second time in my ministry. As he said, I'm in the job just about 18 months. And I will say I landed, um, I had a crash landing literally 
and I say that um, in not the literal sense, I was in the job the first day and I was told you have to get a diplomatic passport because you're accompanying the president to Senegal in three days time. So that's how my job started in this role. And the issue was getting vaccinations and passports and everything. But we got there and we had a great trip. And I'll come back to that in a few moments as well. So we do at government level value these lecture series because they explore the various issues that we're talking about. There are many people across government in NGOs and people directly uh, involved in these activities and many people outside uh, of that direct area watching hopefully online as well. And I do want to welcome not just people here, but especially the people who are watching online. And I do hope you find uh, the next while or so informative as best as I can. So we're here really to discuss the 50th anniversary of Irish Aid. When did it start? It started in 1974. And I know most of you uh, weren't born at that time, isn't that correct? And uh, we'll say no more on that. A few of us might have been. But um, um, Gareth Fitzgerald was the Minister of Foreign Affairs at that time, and he's to be credited for that because he had an international perspective back even in those days as well. And it's very good that he took that initiative uh, to set up Irish aid. And we're, here we are 50 years later, continuing the work as I think he would have envisaged in the government at the time, at a scale, I think to be very proud of uh, when they see what we've been doing in the meantime. But I do want to reflect a little bit on my own personal experience because human nature being human nature is all about the personal stories and the links. And I might throw in a figure or a statistic or two along the way. I can't have that. I'm an accountant, but uh, you'll have to put up with that bit. But I think some of you might be interested in that part of the situation as well, because without the... As I say, the Euros, we can't, we can't do very much. But the government has always been commissioned, I think. In, and we're very lucky. And I do want to actually start by thanking the Irish people for their support for Irish aid. I say that almost everywhere you go. And you say, why? Because you know, um, when it comes to budgets every year and election programmes every so often, most of the parties in Dáil and run for Dáil Éireann are committed to supporting and improving and enhancing the funding for Irish aid and the work they deliver in the furthest behind and the poorest countries in the world. And I've never in my life today, touch wood, have anybody complained to me about the amount of taxpayers' money we're spending on these type of projects. They complain about a lot of other things. But fortunately, I think we're very lucky they don't complain about that because it's deep in the DNA of the Irish people to understand we need to, you know, we needed help years ago when we had a famine. They understand us helping people now and they do get it part of the DNA and there are many people, previous generations, had to emigrate out of necessity and not out of choice and to know what it is to be poor. And I think People appreciate that, and long may that actually continue. The last uh, two years have obviously changed quite a bit, uh, and especially with the invasion of Ukraine, and now we have the very difficult situation in Palestine as well. And I say the Ukraine uh, because it is a, it was a bolt to every one of us in this room. None of us in this room ever experienced a war situation on the continent of Europe. And it's made Irish people think and uh, reassess where we are in the world. And we gloriously had this beautiful concept of we're a neutral country. And yes, we are to an extent. OK, and I say we've always been militarily neutral. And I think everybody in Ireland, without very few exception, would fully subscribe to that. But uh, we're not neutral. And I, this is a point I'm making uh, when I'm speaking to people in recent times, because when it comes to Ukraine, the Irish people are not one bit neutral on that issue. Russia's illegal invasion and Putin's invasion of Ukraine, which is part of what we would see the European uh, bloc. And now they, uh, we hope that they will be in the European Union in due course as soon as possible. And that made us all think. We weren't one bit neutral when we saw that happen. So uh, we always had this grand concept of neutrality. And then especially you look at the Gaza situation, the Irish people are not one bit neutral about that situation. I know we what happened on the 7th of October was wrong and it was the wrong on both sides, simple as that, the wrong on both sides. But when we see what's happening in Gaza, the Irish people are not one bit neutral. So it's important that we distinguish between military neutrality and neutrality in the broadest sense. I'm absolutely convinced that we should be military neutrally at all times. And one of the good reasons is, one, we're a small nation. Two, we were invaded ourselves in the past. Three, we know what it is to be at the other end of it. 
four we've come out of it and are doing well. And now we've had Irish people abroad and we like to have countries that refer us behind, as I've mentioned already. And that's a team we always refer to in the Department of Foreign Affairs. And you'll be familiar with that. But it is really important that when we look at ourselves now, because we're a small nation, our commitment, if you like, from a Department of Defence is in peacekeeping. And Irish are great at that because we've no enemies really in the world. We never invaded anyone. There are lots of other countries not liked in different regions, but nobody has a bad word for the Irish people anywhere you go. And we're accepted as a, a fair and reasonable people. And that's why our skill is in peacekeeping. And we should never underestimate that. I think in over 60 years since we, our first pe peacekeepers went abroad, there have been Irish people Irish soldiers uh, on peacekeeping missions in, for over 60 years without a single day uh, that not being the case. And very few countries can say that. Some other like-minded countries can. But I think what's always important after a conflict is when a peace agreement arrives, holding the peace is often more difficult than the actual war itself because issues can arise and put everything back. And that's why that's our strength in peacekeeping and we can talk to both sides in most situations and I think people respect us for that and long may that continue. That's kind of a little bit of a broad picture of where we are and not particularly associated with my own department, but it influences everything that happens at the Irish government and the Department of Foreign Affairs and the issues that, you know, we talk about ourselves as well. And on the Ukraine, I have found that the meetings I've attended at EU level, um, a big change in attitude all along when I went to my first meeting, everybody wanted to help you, the poorest behind in Africa. And then when I go to meetings at Europe in recent times, uh, some of the Eastern European countries want to help their neighbours, the neighbor, their neighbor, people in the neighbourhood rather than the people in Africa. And there has been a change of tone. There has been a change of emphasis in some countries. And it's something that Ireland and others have to work with. While uh, we have a crisis on our doorstep, we can't pull back and move too much of those resources from, um, from the regions that need it more. But it is happening at EU level, as you all know. And in my own department, we were out there twice in meetings recently where, there, call it what you like, the cuts or the reductions should happen in some of these programmes to fund some of the issues in Ukraine. Ultimately, it will be a matter for the heads of state. But, um, you know, there's a simple... A mathematical solution. We cut everything by 10%. With 10% cuts in the poorest country can have dreadful more impact on the citizen than people who are not as poor. They might be able to absorb some cut, but some people can't absorb any cut. And um, so um, the, the commission were sent back to reconsider their simplistic um, but unfair proposal of just across the board cut and that's where it's at and the heads of state will have to agree that and I'm sure you're all tuned into that better than I am but I just make make that particular point. Now then um, a number around the time Irish aid was set up we joined the EU which was really good for us 1973 and that's been very important but a lot of our work in my department and in the area I deal with as you know is in the, the continent of Africa we have 14 embassies there and a lot of it is connected with the work that we actually do obviously through the NGOs and um, they do quite the, the heavy lifting in most places um, because we don't have the resources there and um, personnel on the ground and some of our embassies in the countries are doing a lot of work in that area directly um, and that's very important and that is a key function of some of our embassies as well. I think people will know um, since um, I moved into this role, my first visit uh, to Senegal was with uh, the president, um, uh, Michael D. Higgins, and then I visited Malawi and Zambia, Ethiopia and Uganda and Nigeria and Ghana most recently. And at this stage, I do want to offer my condolences to the people and the government of Malawi. There was a tragic air airplane accident last night. I don't have the details, but we know it seems a very tragic event and we do want to send our condolences to that country. Um, I want to just touch on a few of the points um, that I don't normally put in a script about some of the visits I made. And one was uh, to Ethiopia. Um, and that was very important to look at areas um, like um, like uh, the port area. No, sorry, in Ethiopia, my mistake. Um, one of the things I was very proud of was to go out there and sign an agreement uh, with their Minister of Finance in relation to and moving on funding that we had suspended because of the difficulties we actually had uh, with Ethiopia. And there was major questions 
of was the funding we were sending getting to where it was needed or was it being used for military purposes? So that agreement was witnessed by the World Bank who were there on our behalf to ensure the funding we do pledge and provide is spent where it actually um, needs to be spent. And we were happy to have them there as a guarantor. Now, during the issues that had arisen um, in Ethiopia, we had continued our humanitarian uh, work and our aid work as best we could, but we but the development work was paused while that while that was going on. And I think to send everybody from our embassy back to Ireland except the ambassador. So there was quite a difficulty there for a period, and it was very good from their point of view, particularly. Um, that signed agreement with us to re-instate um, the development programme. And it was a big signal for them as a government. And I was surprised we were there doing the thing. And everywhere I went the next day, it was just the Minister of State and a visit in a foreign country. But everywhere I saw you on television last night, the Minister of Finance was signing an agreement with yourself. So we often don't realise the impact of some of our work um, that it has locally in the countries um, for the agencies and the people. And that was one example that I do remember on that particular trip, how big it was. I took it as a routine visit, but it's a more than a routine visit from their point of view. So um, sometimes a small country can have a big impact in those areas as well. Um, another issue then as well was my trip to Uganda, just picking bits off it, and we had a great visit there as well. But obviously we had to have a serious discussion um, over lunch uh, with the, my colleague, the counterpart to Minister of State in their Department of Foreign Affairs about the homosexuality legislation. So I raised the issue with him at the coffee stage because I had a feeling if I raised it at the beginning of the dinner, which I mightn't got a chance to eat too much. And I, I got it right, whoever was sitting beside me, Minister, when are you going to raise this issue? Because if we're asked at home, did we raise it? We wanted to be clear. I said, I'll do it at coffee stage, give it a break now. So I raised it at a coffee Soon as I said it, I had to sit back for a half an hour of a lecture. So I think I was right. I had my lunch eaten at that stage and we were able to sit and listen. But he, he was extremely exercised. And subsequently in Geneva, I met with the prime minister uh, of the country as well and made the exact same point as well. She was happy to meet myself at a conference in Nigeria or in Ga Geneva, it was, uh, to discuss that issue because of her long links and Irish long links with them. And their view is very cl clear. I know it's past in the book, but sometimes that happened. It's a matter for the courts. And all they asked was for um, a bit of time. And, and they said, look, at 30 years ago, you wouldn't have done what you've done, but you've done it. You know, we're a little bit, a bit behind. And they were clear, we will get there. But in our time, it doesn't have to be your time, but we will get there. So I was comforted, you know, it's a, it was a matter of principle, it is with some of them, but they actually all accept it will happen in time. And that's actually very important that we have a situation when we're dealing with countries that there is respect uh, and uh, uh, for people with uh, different approaches to life. And I think we're happy with that uh, to, to say that as well. Um, and the one thing I do want to say about the visit um, to Senegal with the president was that he was the guest speaker, as you know, at that major event. And I was very pleased just last Friday to be in Oris and Ukturan when the United Nations Food and Agriculture Award gave him the, I'm not sure is it the Agricola Medal or the Agricola Medal, but it's translated into Latin, it means farmer, and that means food production. And because of his work over the years, he was singled out and he's in the, the very distinguished company with a lot of very senior, distinguished former presidents around the world have received that award. And it is a recognition, not just of the standing the president has, but also that Ireland has, that the, the UN saw fit to make that presentation last week. And I want to acknowledge his good work in that regard. Um, some of the projects that we've been working in in some of the countries as well, um, especially in Malawi, which we all know is about the poorest country in the world, is the social cash transfer program. It was fantastic. And those of you might have heard me saying this before. No electricity to 90% of the houses, but some of them are getting on without it. They have their little um, panels outside the door. They can charge their phones and do all their business and all their communications. And it looks as if they bypassed the national grid in a generation and they're getting on without it. Now we're helping them, you know, in terms of their food production, which their farms out there are not sustainable. They're very small. And really what we have to do in those countries, and it's the next step for us. They're good at the farm production. Their land is fertile. They have good climates and they can get three crops or four crops a year much more than we can here because they have the sun and the rain at different times. But to sell it 
to the local merchant, who sells it to the merchant in the town, who sells it to the merchant in the city, who sells it to the company that's going to process it. And the poor farmer probably gets 5% of the final value of the product. So I've been preaching to them, like we did in Ireland, they must get farmers together, the farmers union, to form co-ops. And that's what happened in Ireland years ago with all small farmers and co-ops are now some of our biggest business. It'll take a generation or two, but unless do, they do that, they'll never get value for their food product. And it does allow them um, um, provide um, a better quality product. That particular country I visited, um, uh, a particular place, we provided the laboratory and the Canadians provided funding uh, for processing the food. And with that and the certification of the, the laboratory, they were able to sell it directly from the farms in the local town into the supermarket shelves in the city and get really good added value and added income for themselves and their families. So that was one great thing. And the social crash, cash transfer is a mechanism that we in selected poor areas, actually put cash on their cards, three euro, three euro a week to a house, which is phenomenal money. And I met mothers out there, widows out there and big families, and I've asked her an impact. What's the impact? She said, I can now educate my children to second level with that money that we're getting. And they could go to the local equivalent of a credit union and get the cash out or say, pay a bill or keep it in savings for their education. And that is an, a clear example of what we've been able to do. Zambia, I was very pleased to visit visit a lecture theatre that Irish Aid built about 40 years ago in the university and we were back now refurbishing it and making it up to scratch for modern day uh, facilities. So some of the countries I was uh, taken aback in Uganda, I was met uh, by a school um, tradition and they did a traditional Irish dance and literally they would have any, won any fish hole uh, contest in our, they were so good. I was just flabbergasted at how good they were. And they get it, and some of the countries are able to merge their dancing into the Irish dancing into the river dance version. And it's fabulous to watch, if you like, the way they can coordinate it all. But when I was in the, uh, the Karamoja region, you, you see rural poverty there. And I think you know what I'm talking about there. And uh, the little huts or little villages, and there'd be another one five miles up the road. And uh, the important thing out in that country was so many girls get attacked on the way to and from school. And everywhere I went uh, <clears throat> in Uganda, people asked for funding for boarding schools. So when the girls in particular could go and be safe for a couple of months or go home at the weekend and not having to walk several miles each way each day uh, when they, a lot of attacks actually happened on that situation. So it was new to me to hear about people looking for boarding schools, but I got the message very quick. Not sure where we are on it. We're helping the individual classrooms and maybe other countries are helping with the accommodation, but we are actually helping in those areas as well. Um, I met a lot of great Irish people, as you know, when you're out there. And one I do want to um, single out is Father Andrew Campbell. He's a dub, as they say. And um, he, he um, in Ghana, he runs a, um, a leprosarium, which is for an area of the people who have had leprosy and have suffered uh, the physical um, difficulties with, and they're now cured. And he has a community for, for them there. And he's a Trojan. Like if we had one of him in every country, some of the NGOs might be nearly done away with. And I say that in a way, he's embedded in the ground out there, like a lot of our people. But because he was a priest, he actually arrived with that stature. He's so good running this centre that he set up himself that the municipal authority and the government are ploughing lots of money into him because they see him as a man who gets something done. So on that, he's, he's built a church, he's built a mosque, you know, on the local authority site in the city because he's so good. He's done accommodation for, we call it the, the equivalent of, we would say, approved housing bodies. And his original work is what he's there for. But he's now actually helping the entire city, uh, re, you know, regardless of religion or creed or anything like that. And he's very open. And uh, it was a pleasure to meet him. And on that day, again, we found... Um, uh, one elderly nun um, who lives 200 miles away came down especially for that mass that morning on St. Patrick's Day. And most of her work started with the missionary priests and nuns in those countries. And it's something, um, most of what we've done is based on the Christian ethos. And we come, even though we don't talk about the religion, it's in our DNA to be a bit like that as well. But then again, there's other regions in the world that have changed just really the Gaza situation. I'm not going to go through the figures of how many have been killed. And I think all we want to ensure is that, there, that the violence stops. There's wrong on both sides. 
you know, and anyone who thinks all the wrong is on one side is blinded. There's absolute wrong on both sides. And um, what happened uh, before the 7th of October, that Israeli and the illegal settlements was wrong. What happened on the 7th of October was wrong. What's been happening since then is wrong. And we do have to have a ceasefire and, and hostages release so we can get into meaningful discussions. And it'll always be a troubled spot, I think, as long as any of us are around, but definitely we need to de-escalate de it. And Ireland's recognition of Palestine and the UN Security Council recognising it, um, in, I think it was yesterday, is also very important as well. So look, we are making moves and it does often take international pressure uh, to do those things. And we are a small but significant player, especially at European level. So we do want to um, make sure the funding gets through to those who need it, especially I'm very pleased with the report produced by uh, Catherine Colonna there some time ago. You'd be familiar with that. There was no evidence of the allegations that had been made by Israel. And one of the last meetings at the EU, the EU, EU Commission had paused some of its funding pending that report and they hadn't reinstated it. They held some money back, about 60 million. And the day I was there and a number of other countries asked, you know, for them to lift the pause and that now that they had the report, and they, they did move on that straight away and they're, they're allowing the funding go through. Um, but a lot of people um, were very slow and it was causing serious difficulty to UNRWA when the funding was paused. But I hope that's over. But the difficulty remains getting the food supplies through. And I think we all see the difficulties on that uh, all the time. Um, the other point I would say is I mentioned Ukraine. It has changed our context here at local level and there are various other conflicts in the world. And the one I do want to highlight is the war in Sudan. Like what's happening in Sudan is so tragic, it's going on so long. And we all know it's an area that's not safe to go, it's not safe to work in. And that's really the bigger challenge. And over 11 million people have uh, been displaced there multiple, many of them multiple times. And I think we haven't, the Irish people haven't got that. I don't think Europe has got that message. I don't think America, and there's, I would ask everyone collectively in the room and as all to think, why are we paying less attention to Sudan than we are to Gaza or, or, or Ukraine? There's a reason for it. And I would ask people to think about that. And it's something I think ourselves here at EU level, you know, um, um, it's a fair question for people to ask in some countries, why is more attention given to one than the other? I'm not going to say I know the answer to that, but I do know um, we're not consistent. I don't think any of us in um, this part of Europe or other parts of the world are consistent in our approach. While acknowledging it's not safe to be there, I think there's deeper issues that, you know, we, um, some issues get more traction. I just put it in simple English that way. So there are, so, there are some of my reflections from my trip. Some of you have heard it before. I do just want to say one or two small things before I conclude is I think you all know the, the, our ODA Irish budget this year is €2 billion. Euro continues to grow and um, we're not at 0.7 percent uh, yet we're over halfway there and people would say we should be doing more but i think relatively in terms of the value the amount of it is um very high because and uh, the, the, the it's based on the gni um figures which are growing substantially because of the growth in the economy and we are continuing to grow our funding um, um, for ODA. A lot of it is directly through our own department and some of it is climate change funding, some of it goes through our European budget and then some of it goes through the Department of Agriculture as well and the climate finance issue is going to be significant over the next couple of years and I'm not saying what they will reach to 0.7% so if I preempted the first question, there's the answer. I don't know. But look at what we are doing is an awful lot for the size of our country. And um, I think it's very important. And it all goes back, and I'm going to conclude on this. I started um, by saying that the Irish people um, understand what we're doing in that area. And that's because um, we relied on the remittances from abroad. When I was going to school, there was this figure I used to hear about remittances. This is all the Irish people gone abroad. That's happening in every country. I see it in my post office, in my constituency for years. You all see it. People come in on the Thursday or Friday and they're sending the money back home. Some of them are sending money home so they can go back and build a house and go home. Some of them send them back to support their families like we did years ago. And um, I think
think two other things, I mentioned the credit unions that we are helping out there in the Department of Foreign Affairs, because people need microfinance, that's what it's all about, and the Department of Finance and Revenue Commissioners are helping some countries with their tax and revenue administration, which is very important. And I will just say um, one last story that took, took my heart the most um, in all my travels so far, uh, Travel so far was when I went to the United Nations on the second anniversary of Ukraine and we had a special session dealing with what they call the stolen children. So that was the saddest, but there was a good part to the end of it as well. And that was, um, we, there are thousands of children where um, where Russia um, forced to come in and if there had been a bomb, if they see in some places unaccompanied children, they take them and they bring them back home and put them on up for adoption for parents in Russia who are looking for children to adopt and they're removed completely. And we met cases and we had four children back who had, whose teachers and grandparents had gone and maybe the parents were killed, you know. Some of them were separated in different wards in the hospital and they found a kid running around and where's your mother, where's your father? And they just presumed they were dead and sometimes they may not have been dead and they were taken abroad and they could only do bring them back for adoption from Russia if there is a family link with the particular child. And that often fell to the elderly grandparents to go and rescue a grandchild because maybe the mother and father may have been dead and some have come back. And it was one of the saddest aspects of war. It just shows you how bad a war can be. But the good news was that program is working well and we've met some of the children who told their individual stories and it was heart, heartbreaking to hear the, the first half of the story, but very uplifting to meet some of the children who were brought back home. And they're the kind of things that touch your hearts and keep us going and things, and they're the kind of things we want to make sure don't continue into the world. So there was a good end to that story, but there's a lot more to be done because a lot of the children haven't been brought home yet. And um, I just say that it was, um, if I'm asked, one of the, the touching things, um, the, the biggest day for me was addressing the UN um, Assembly on the anniversary, but in the afternoon there was another half to the story, but with a good end. So I say thank you all for listening. I appreciate your time. And the only thing I do have to say is after the weekend that was in it, I have to be back in the doll for two o'clock. So I'm here for a little while. Hope I haven't gone on too long. And if you have questions, I hope they're not too hard, but I will do my best. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, for that. And I just when I was listening, it occurred to me that, um, you know, there's plenty in what you had to say about the policy, about the funding, about Irish Aid's work. Um, but it's really good to get the personal reflections also of a minister who's, you know, gone to see what the work is, to take an understanding of what it is and to have a deeper appreciation. I think we all get a deeper appreciation of that from um, that kind of mediating it through your own personal reflections, I think is really, really helpful as well. And thank you very much for that. So we have some time for, for questions. We will help the minister make sure that he's um, out of here at, at a time that gets him back to Leinster House by the appointed hour. So I'll have to keep an eye on the clock. But meanwhile, those of you who have questions, please let me know when you uh, indicate who you are. Your name is always helpful. And if you have a designation, that'll be helpful as well for those of you in the room and also online. And there are questions coming in online as well. So I'll take the first question here um, at the front. Hello, Minister. My name is Barry Colfer and I'm the Director of Research here at the Institute. A very warm welcome. Uh, I'd love to ask you who's going to get the fifth seat in in Northwest, but I'm not. I'm going to put you on the spot now, right? But I have a, a an important question for you that I know you as minister and this government have ambitious plans to increase Ireland's development aid activities and obviously then its budget. And it's a fundamental question of politics I have for you that amid all the competing competing demands for resources and indeed limited resources, are you confident that? Ireland is on track to indeed increase its development aid activities in the years ahead? Yeah, the straight answer to that is yes, because I'm sure if you went back to 50 years, it was a minuscule start, but it has planted a seed that has grown ever since. And I think the only difficulty, and it's remarkable, I should call it a difficulty, because the Irish economy is prospering so much uh, at the moment, and our GNI and, our, you know, our output is growing so much, Um you should say we should be able to provide more of that for development aid. But the figures have gone up so much in recent years in the Irish economy since the recession. Um, we haven't kept pace with that. Now, what I will say is 
the, the, the one big issue I would be suggesting at government level, because obviously you all know how much funding we're providing for the for the Ukrainian community in Ireland. And so once the first year allocation comes into those calculations, that figure is dropping because there's not as many coming in that recent months as there were early on. So I think the drive will be to keep the overall figure the same and use some of the funding that's not now going to be calculated into that figure that will fall to the Irish Exchequer in the normal course of fund, uh, funding operations outside of this um, um, ODA figure. That's if some of that can be retained in the ODA figure, which where it has been for the last couple of years, in the last two years. So that's that's a challenge we'll be putting to our ministers at the estimate, at, at the estimates, which will be, you know, and before the summer, we start talking on the budget. Now is the time we're going to get into that in July. So a few questions coming in online. I know there's some people I'll come to the um, the, um to, to you and the front row there in a moment, but I'll just um take one from the uh, the virtual audience. Sulagna Maitre and UCD, Thanks you for a very insightful lecture and the inspiring anecdotes. And going forward, could you please comment on Irish Aid's focus on addressing gender-based violence and how it will be prioritised in the yeah, strategy? Yeah, and, and I actually apologise for not referring to that. I would say as every single visit I've gone to, the issue of gender-based violence um, has been a key issue for me. I've never gone on a visit to a country without going to a centre, mainly where uh, women and especially young girls have actually have been subject to domestic violence. I've gone to centres where they meet afterwards. I've gone to the places where they have the, the young babies. And uh, I would say um, in Ireland, I'm talking about at home, I think Ireland has become more aware of gender-based violence and domestic violence in recent years than we were here before. I think you all know in the old days, what goes on behind closed doors says behind closed doors. We've come a long way from that philosophy and it has very much moved forward. And I do want to thank the officials in the department. Every single visit I've made, uh, the issue of domestic violence has been on the agenda and we've always visited the areas to see where we can help. In the frontier. Thanks. Thanks, Minister Fleming. I appreciate your, your speech. Um, my name is Breda Gahan. I actually started working with Concern in 1988 in Sudan. I lived there for a couple of years. Um, I'm a health worker, nurse midwife, and I'm really distraught at what's going on there right now. I have colleagues I started working with in 1988. They're now refugees in Egypt, other neighboring countries. And I mean, the war is between two internal people funded by, we're not sure, but I want you to please and encourage the Irish government to amplify, you know, the situation in Sudan. It really is horrific. And I think we need to call out as a government, you know, the weapons manufacturers, purchasers, sellers, buyers, without the modern day weapons, this kind of war could not be happening in Sudan. I was there for the coup in 89. I was under house arrest myself for a couple of weeks, couldn't tell anybody, no communication. At that time, I knew I would come to no harm. Now I could not go back to Sudan, to where I lived and worked for two years without a lot of fear. So please keep it high on the agenda and call out the weapons manufacturers and the people funding the two generals. Thank you. And thank you for that. And I did touch on Sudan. And what you said is another personal experience. I, I see we're taking close notes of that and we will deal with that. I know our Minister of Foreign Affairs regularly raises the issues of Sudan, but the, in terms of, I suppose, general discourse every day in the media, it's about the Ukraine and it's about Gaza and Sudan. And I pose the question mischievously, if you like to call it, why are we not dealing with Sudan and why is it not getting the coverage? There's, there's a reason for that. And I think the Irish people, if it's brought to their attention, um, I think um, Irish people, if they can see more of it on their TV screens, it'll help move the dial. Because what people see in their, on their TV screens has a big, big impact. And uh, uh, that, that, that's something we will take up, definitely. Actually, yeah. At that time, yeah. the university was destroyed. Thank you very much. Uh, for your question. And it's great to have your insight and particular experience uh, brought to bear on that discussion. So I really appreciate that. Um, down the back, just in case you can't, we can't, you, just in case you think we can't see the people at the back, we can. Just right. put your hand on your grant. Just right. tell us who you are. And uh, Thank you very much. My name is Adekun Gomez, and my life journey started in Ghana. So I was, uh, my ears picked up when you uh, made reference to Ghana. 
Um, so now, um, I was fortunate last year to be here uh, for you all um, uh, speech. And um, uh, one of the things I remembered very much from that and subsequently was your uh, suggestion that people from the Southern Hemisphere should be um, uh, represented on the boards. And when I mentioned this to my uh, fellow Africans, they were really, really grateful. They, the way they put it is that, well, I think uh, uh, if you uh, want to go to a doctor or a, a, a teacher, they have to know uh, what is wrong. So we are grateful. Um, now, you also uh, were uh, mentioning uh, uh, who would remember uh, uh, 50 years ago. It looks like uh, uh, this year is the year of anniversaries and uh, Malawi, which you made reference to, and Gambia, sorry, Zambia, they are both uh, celebrating uh, 60 years. So uh, that is something uh, uh, we look forward to. Um, the reference to the, um, uh, the credit union, I'm delighted to uh, uh, say that uh, Esther Oklu from Ghana, my country, was a co-founder of uh, well, a leading micro-lending uh, 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 person, a co-founder of World Women's Banking. So I'm uh, uh, grateful about that. I just finished by uh, saying that uh, now um, Irish aid is 50 years. Uh, for those who uh, probably remember 43 years ago, it was the time when I said that Michael O'Leary became the tonister. O'Leary the socialist, that is. I arrived here uh, 43 years ago tomorrow, and uh, I kind of, uh, you know, was uh, had the uh, uh, pleasure of uh, going through all the ne uh, negotiations to uh, uh, form the uh, that government. Now it just happens that this 50 years also we've got an election, and uh, everybody's excited. Now I would just uh, like to say that I'd love you to be the minister for a, a, a lot more longer uh, uh, with all this talk going on about uh, uh, elections. So thank you very much. And I think I'll, I'll end there. Thanks. Okay. Thank you for that. And I'll comment on that. Um, not, not the last one. I, 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 I hear what you're saying, but you know, um, I, I didn't mention that when I moved into the department, I was very keen because I met um, all the NGOs. And what got me was a number of our NGOs, which you've referred to, had no representative on their full board from the Global South. And I personally thought, um, I had a difficulty with that straight away because it sounded like as if all the white educated Northern Europeans were best placed to tell the people in all the countries I've mentioned how to implement projects on the ground. And I just had an uneasy feeling with that. And some of the NGOs, I met all the NGOs one by one when uh, the major NGOs one by one when they came in. And I spotted that after a few meetings and some, some people had representatives from the Global South. So we made it a condition of funding um, that unless there was um, a member of the, the Global South on their full board, it would be an issue as far as I was concerned. Every one of the major NGOs have done it. One or two might take this year to have it completed, depending on the cycle. And as you will, many of you will know, I called the meeting with uh, the representatives of the Global South and all the major NGOs recently, directly with them, not with the chairman of the board or the chief executive, directly with them. And I think um, I would hope to have another meeting with them later this year. No secrets, you know, the minutes and everything from will be circulated to their own um, their own NGOs. But it's important that they have a direct line to the minister to make sure their voice has been held, held as well. And I would expect that that will continue into the future. So one, one little change I did, which I forgot to um, mention, but thanks for me. And I get everything else you say as well. And thank you. Very good. Um, Noel, oh, I see two people there, but I'll just ask you this question from online. Noel O'Regan is wondering whether Irish aid is moving into areas to alleviate the effects of climate change. Yeah, I, I did mention that enough. And we, we all know the sustainable development goals and the, the, the climate finance funding is a big step in that direction. And I think everything we do, it's embedded in our work now. Every Everything we do has got to do with climate change because food security and climate are you know, they're, they're not just interlinked, they're, they're one and the same issue. And everything we do um, has to make sure it is sustainable and look at what we're at. So it's actually nearly embedded in everything we do, but the climate uh, finance funding will be an extra um, uh, amount of support directly, a separate line of support. And that can come through the Department of Finance, not just the Department of Foreign, Foreign Affairs as well. Very good. And just in the second row here, um, please. And then the gentleman behind. 
Hi, uh, Jane Ann um, from DOCUS, uh, the Irish Network for um, Organisations uh, Working Overseas. Just a couple of questions just on um, the ODA. So obviously um, we haven't really kept, I suppose, pace, as you mentioned, with the rising uh, GNI um, and, you know, our percentage that's being spent overseas is very much stagnating um, and will require kind of a a significant, I think, uh, jump forward if we are to achieve 0 0.7, uh, particularly spent overseas by 2030. So I just wanted, I suppose, this is the last year of uh, this government or this government's budget. Do you see that there is a possibility that the government would create a, a pathway to actually achieving that um, goal within the next five or six years? Um, I'd like your thoughts on that. And then also just stemming on from the last question around kind of the the importance of engaging kind of the global south and particularly um, the shift towards locally led development. And um, I'd be keen to hear your views just in terms of the direction for our overseas aid program, you know, obviously civil side organizations, but also in our multilateral um, agreements, how we can move more towards uh, locally led um, development. Thank you. With locally led development, but it's important that we have proper governance arrangements in place because um, we don't want to find a situation you can divest too much autonomy to local levels. And that's why a lot of our work are through recognised NGOs, you know, and really, it's off, it's, I would say it's often up to the NGOs to, to have the people on the ground. Uh, delivering it locally and that's why it's important to have board members and maybe some of them i i don't know how different ones operate but maybe th there should be uh, a committee from the local local region you're working in reporting directly on major projects rather than us suggesting what should happen so i agree with you on locally led providing we have adequate governance in place and that's what we, we we have to avoid because if something starts undermining the governance of projects it does more harm than good in the long run um what i'll give you the straight answer you're talking about the uh, uh, increasing the the figure um uh, as a percentage of gni and as you rightly said there's an election coming up sometime well it has to be by next february i'll just put it out so i would genuinely suggest without making trouble for myself my party leader you should take it up directly with each of the parties because the government doesn't run as a government. The parties run. And when the election was over, the parties came together to negotiate. I don't think anyone will have a, an overall majority. That's hardly a secret, is it? So um, so what I would, I would actually say is at the end of the election, parties will come together with their manifestos and they will negotiate an agreement. So it won't be the government, it'll be the individual parties will actually do that. And then when the government is formed, you know, the, the government um, departments will implement what's agreed. So as between now and that period, I think you need to step up your work. And sorry now for all the parties and uh, given trouble. But I think you should know that anyway. That's really where it's at. It's not so much the officials now. We're in the run-up to election. You need to get it to the senior politicians in each of the parties. Government and opposition. Oh, yeah. yeah. Not sure. I didn't have... Yeah. Yeah, oh, no, I you didn't. No, I know that. No, I, know I that. said each of the parties. Absolutely. I'm not even predicting... You did. Yeah. You did. You were very clear. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Minister, uh, for sharing all your impressive stories from all those countries. So, uh, in, in some of those countries, we work as well. And I'm really impressed by all these uh, stories of change that you shared, which is not a very common sight. Uh, uh, my question would be uh, directly about the policy uh, that Irish, Irish Aid has. It's called Better, Better World Policy. Uh, well, uh, my name is Mahbub Kabir, by the way. Uh, I work for Christian Blind Mission, CBM Ireland. And our focus is on uh, promoting inclusion of people with disabilities through the mainstream development and humanitarian actions, which is not a easy job because like disability is often forgotten or an after aftermath of any mainstream development and humanitarian action. And we, with limited resources, uh, it's, it's a tough job for uh, such a small organization uh, called CBM. So uh, we identified recently that, well, uh, disability is cursorily mentioned in Better World Policy with no strategic kind of intent. So, and we recently uh, carried out a report uh, doing a kind of quite extensive research that, well, there are opportunities for IH8 to adopt an inclusive approach, a strategic approach to promote disability, disability inclusion uh, across all the de development and humanitarian action that uh, it sub it funds. Would you be interested to actually hear and listen to the, the findings? And 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 also, it's probably we just guess that it's it's a good time for Irish Aid to 
uh, initiate that conversation of an inclusive development because uh, the uh, better world policy is five year old now. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, if you're interested, we'd be happy to share the findings of that report and would be interested to work with Irish Aid as, as partner to support Irish Aid to yeah. promote inclusive approach to development. Thank you. Yeah. I'm very pleased with that question, and I would ask you to make sure you contact our department on that, because obviously the issue of disabilities and access to facilities and resources is a problem at home, which we're more alert to now than maybe we were previously. And I think everybody is far more conscious, and it has to continue across all government departments, including Irish Aid. And I would ask you to, to give us your findings, let's discuss it such that future program it gets embedded you know, in Irish Aid projects going forward. And remarkably, I was out canvassing in my own constituency and exactly what a lady raised that exact issue. And I said, because I thought she knew I was in the Department of Foreign Affairs and she was raising it with me. And I asked her um, about where she was coming at and she didn't know I was in the department. So obviously, um, it's the second time in four days this has been raised with me now. And I was delighted that the woman raised it. And here you're saying, you know, from a completely different place here in Dublin today, raising the same. So we're duty bound to do it. My, you know, you know um, we're duty bound to do that to incorporate it into our policies. Thank you. Nora Owen is a board member here in the IAA and she's chair of our justice group and a former minister, I'm sure known to you, wonders, is there still a tension about multinational versus bilateral aid donations? <laughs> Yeah, um, there is, and what tends to win out is pragmatism, right? And I often wonder, it's so easy for us at the department level, write a cheque for 50 million to send it off to and you go do the work and send us back a report in 12 months time. And that's a very easy way. Now we're a small country, we can't project manage everything ourselves. But it is a question I would always be raising. It's so easy for any government to send a check off to um, one of the EU or UN agencies or a group that's working on a particular project. And it's important that we have visibility of what happens on those issues. I would say it's very easy administratively and very convenient. But as the politician, I think it's too easy and too convenient. I, I would say... The politicians, we would have um, prefer, not that there's anything in it for us, but a little bit more hands-on. And it's always easy to write a big check. But I, you're, it takes time to be sure. And it goes into a fund with funds from other countries and you get a report on what's done and we get 5% of that fund or 15% of that fund. And it doesn't relate back to the Irish people. And I say the Irish people, that's the one morning, they get all the NGOs. The Irish people love the NGOs. But these international funds and UN and EU, they're not as warm to them as they are to the NGOs. And to keep the public on our side, they're happier with the NGOs doing work directly. That's, me, that's my own personal opinion. Uh, and the more we can do directly that we can see visibility from what our taxpayers' money is used on, the better ultimately. But I accept the pragmatism of getting a check out to somebody else to do the work is easy. So there is a tension there as far as I'm concerned. Good. So over here, just here, Anna, yep. Uh, hi, um, Trevor Mallard, the New Zealand Ambassador, and thank you, Minister, uh, for your speech and the, the areas you covered. I also want to thank um, Irish Aid and yourself for the work that's beginning to be done in the Pacific in cooperation with New Zealand for Pacific-led uh, aid. Um, I'm going to put one little thing in brackets. As a former politician, I'd love to be able to write out $50 million checks. <laughs> it's um, and something we... <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, um, yes, it's something we never found that easy, but it's a different sort of economy. Um, uh, Minister, my my question is just one of, a, of keeping in mind small countries and tiny countries, yeah. if we're talking about uh, Pacific, when you're talking to your EU colleagues, because they do quite a lot of projects there, sometimes the bureaucracy that comes with a program is too much for small countries to handle. Yeah. Uh, for example, audits have been failed because people haven't kept stubs from airline tickets for three years. And 
in one case, a three million dollars had to be returned yeah. from a small nation for reasons like that. And the one other thing which sits with that is the deforestation yeah. regulations and the inability of countries that don't have historic records. They might only have two thousand people uh, to cope with those when they, um, when we are all trying to help them export to Europe. Yeah. So it's really just, can you? Can you keep reminding your colleagues yeah. that not everyone uh, has the level of bureaucracy of Europe and the ability to um, uh, to keep records in quite the same way? Yeah, and and I, I take that point. Maybe is that some of it being government to government? If there's an NGO underground, you know, we have a valid intermediary underground in some of those places that you know can help in those situations. But I take your point exactly. Thanks. Well, right there behind. Thank you, Ambassador. Just behind. Yeah. Thank you, Minister, and thank you for your speech. It's very, um, very interesting, and for your anecdotes as well. And congratulations on fifty years of Irish Aid. Um, my name is Amy Rose McGovern from Concern Worldwide, and um, while I just want to go back to your previous point and recognizing the challenges of, you know, the administrative challenges and the challenges of governance as well in terms of achieving, you know, what we'd like to in, for locally led development. I think what we can all agree is the important thing is that. Um, that um, aid is, is available, assistance is actually accessible. And I think it's more of a comment than a question, but if Irish aid in the department can use its, its influence and continue to use its influence where it can to ensure that humanitarian assistance is accessible. So there are some challenges um, in for, for local or national organizations to actually access uh, financing uh, for emergency response or humanitarian programs. Um, and I think that there's a lot that we can do there to make it more accessible in terms of rules, uh, compliance, um, you know, timelines, that kind of thing. But yeah, I think that's probably somewhere we could make the um, the assistance that is available more effective and accessible. So, Okay, and if that's a suggestion, what can be done in terms of all of the governance simplified, but I did mention earlier, we do need, you know, um, transparency as well at the end of the day. And I do accept in some difficult situations, um, um, it's often hard to achieve everything down to the last euro or whatever. But like anything on that to simplify procedures and still provide a level of assurance we would love to see. Did I miss anybody who had his or her hand up? I have a couple more questions and I'll just take two together just okay. from this, if, if that's okay. Um, Rose Hogan is the Sustainable Agriculture Advisor at Trocra. Thanks you for your interesting reflections. And mentions um, how much, or could you mention, um, or I think she's mentioning, how much Irish aid funding is going to the UN Committee on Food Securities Processes. It seems to have been sidelined in favour of the UN Food Systems Summit, which Rose says is less rights-based or less of a democratic platform. Um, and then the other question here from Josephus, Josephus Eli, the Embassy of Ireland in Sierra Leone, Irish Aid was recognised in 2012 as one of the most impactful donors. And um, the question is, how do you think, from your experience, uh, Irish Aid is viewed now amongst its peers? Okay, first question first. I don't know. I'm honest enough as a politician when I don't know the answer. I'm probably one of the few who says so, and I'm not going to bluff. So I'm going to ask our department to get a response. You know who it's from and send it into yourselves here. Um, Irish Aid, in, uh, I think their name has gone up a lot internationally. I'm only here a couple of years in my job and everywhere I go, it's absolutely recognised. And I didn't, there was a quote in my script um, from one of the countries I visited and um, where the, the government minister said, only for the Irish Aid prog programmes here, there'd be phenomenal problems in their country. That, that was the sentence I skipped. So it's fine as, uh, oh, sorry. Um, Food and agriculture. On the previous, um, the Department of Development Assistance budget is increased by six, 60 million this year to six to seven seven six million, represented an eight point four percent increase on last year, and it includes additional forty two point five million on climate finance. So, um, and I will be advocating to maintain this commitment in the forthcoming budget, which um we hope to be able to deliver uh, in the autumn. So, look at you. You take the point on that. And um, I, 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 I yes. Yeah. What, what what I've noticed, what, what I've noticed in my visits, and this is only a personal observation, and um, because normally when I do a visit, I 
the want to see project. But normally the first day I have to meet all the officials and the minister here and the minister there and the officials here and whatever. But they are all very um, grateful for the work that we do and it provides them uh, with substantial support and assistance that they couldn't possibly reach to. So uh, practically everywhere I go, we have representatives of the elected government and senior officials acknowledging uh, without Irish aid to be in a very, very difficult situation. So I think based on the countries I've been in, you know, we're higher than we would have been previously in terms mm. of estimation. Mm. And the achievements are also in part a legacy of what's been done throughout the whole 50 years. Yeah, and one thing builds on the other um, over the, the years and the decades. So thank you very much. Uh, the, uh, that's been a really interesting um, hour. Um, I enjoyed the presentation. I know everybody else did as well. Um, uh, just from the responses and the questions, plenty more questions coming in as well online. Can't get to them all. It's a really always a very um, uh, uh, stimulating and interesting uh, area of work for us here in the Institute. Um, but we couldn't do it without the close uh, cooperation and professionalism of, uh, well, the minister, also his staff and Irish aid. It's always a pleasure to work with you. Thank you very much uh, for your sponsorship and support for this series. And we look forward very much to having you here again and to having Irish aid here again and to keeping up this discussion uh, on this really critical topic. So once again, thank you very much. Thank, thank, you. thank you all. Thank you.